Authentication for web applications. Boy, is this ever a big topic. Security is hard, and on top of that, it's often one of the first things you have to tackle on a new project. The hash. I'm going to use the term hash a lot in this presentation, so it's going to be useful for me to start by explaining this basic term. A hash function is any algorithm that maps data of arbitrary length to data of a fixed length. So no matter what sort of data you put in, you always get a variable within a certain range. As an example of a simple hash function, let's take a string, convert every character of the string to a number, add them all together, and mod the result by 100. This is about as simple as a hash function can possibly get. Let's call it the cheese hash. No matter what string you put in, you are going to get a result from 0 to 99. The same string will always produce the same result. On top of that, the hash function is one way. Cheese will always produce 21, but if we have 21, we can't necessarily guess that cheese was the initial value. Hash functions are crucial to computing science. Exploring the concept and all of its myriad useful functions are beyond the scope of this presentation and probably deserve an entire episode on their own. Now, what purpose do hashes serve? Well, they're often used to protect very sensitive data. Let's imagine, for example, that you have a server running an online wine cellar manager. You aren't holding on to any data that's particularly dangerous. The worst case scenario is that somebody can see the wines in someone else's cellar. So you maintain a database of usernames and passwords in order to determine who's who. Now some clever hacker comes along and exploits a SQL injection vulnerability in your poorly written wine software. His username is semicolon quote select star from users, and he finds some way to dump the entire user table into his browser window. Now, our hacker has stolen every username and password in your entire wine application, which is still not that important to us. I mean, who cares if he puts a Shiraz in someone else's cellar? The stakes are very low. But with a bank of usernames and passwords, our hacker friend can start tracking down the other users of our site and trying their passwords out on banking sites and mail sites and what have you. This is very bad. When writing software, it's often best to assume that a hacker might find a way to get access to your database and do your very best to reduce the damage that she can do once she gets there. Your user's passwords are likely one of the most sensitive bits of data that you will touch. I mean, aside from credit card numbers, which you shouldn't touch at all. Ever. Ever. A common way to protect the user's password is to run the password through a hash function, and then store the result of the hash instead of the password itself. Then, when authenticating the user, take their password, hash it, and check that the result matches the hashed value that you have stored. When selecting a hash function, then, it's important that the hash not be susceptible to hash collisions. A hash collision is when two different inputs produce the same output after having been run through the hash function. If, for example, we were to use my not particularly secure cheese hash function, if I had the password cheese, an attacker could pretend to be me simply by trying words until he found one that also hashed to the value of 21. My hash function has a small number of possible outputs, so the chance of a collision is very high. If my hash were to produce 512 bits of output, with an equal chance of producing results across all 512 bits, like some popular cryptographic hashes, there would be 2 to the power of 512 different possible outputs, which would make the chance of a random collision very, very, very small. One of the ways that cryptographic hashes get broken is that dedicated cryptographers find a way to force a collision. If they can do it in less than a couple of hundred million tries, the hash is probably not going to be very useful. Modern computers can run hash functions very, very quickly. Okay, so an attacker has stolen my user's table. But this time, every single password has been hashed using a secure hash function. There's still a way that this attacker can make off with my user's passwords. All they have to do is generate a list of all probable passwords, and then run the same hash function that I'm running on every single item in the list. This list of all possible hashed passwords is called a rainbow table. Once they've done that, all they need to do is compare this list with every user in my database. If the hash matches, they've found the password. The person who picked a 28-character passphrase as his password is probably safe from this sort of attack. The person who picked Hunter 2 is not. We can add an extra layer of security against this sort of attack by salting the hash, which is also a valid culinary technique. Before we run the hash function, we include, with the password, some bit of data that we have access to. The username, for example. That way, an attacker can't use a pre-calculated table of password hashes. They have to create a new table for each user. 
You'll notice that even with these extra security features, given enough time and enough processing power, it's possible to eventually get access to someone's password. And the weaker their password, the easier it is to get access to. As a user of websites, you might consider maintaining different passwords for different websites, or at the very least use a special password for your financials and email. One of the most common bits of advice when it comes to security and cryptography is not to try to write it yourself. Any person can invent a security system so clever that she or he can't think of how to break it. The best crypto code is public, open source, and well understood. Even when salting and hashing your passwords, it's best to use a library rather than trying to roll your own. There are lots of subtle ways to get things wrong. Don't try to be clever, don't try to reinvent the wheel, and definitely do not try to write a system that performs any cryptographic operations in browser JavaScript. JavaScript crypto is hopeless. There's a great article on this topic, but to summarize, it is impossible to run secure JavaScript code without delivering that JavaScript code and the page that it's running on and any assets on the page that it's running on over a securely encrypted connection, at which point you already have a securely encrypted connection, so why bother running cryptography code in JavaScript? To understand why, think about this. Imagine you have a complicated function called secure hash that takes a user's password and hashes and salts it. All it takes to ruin this function is for an attacker to inject a piece of code into your page that rewrites secure hash as a function that instead takes the provided password and sends it to a server in Russia. And it's possible to inject that piece of code by replacing it as you request it, so long as you're transmitting that code unencrypted, or by including it as part of a different file that you're loading. Really, if a third party has access to any step in your page's load, you are shit out of luck. On top of that, JavaScript itself is a poor candidate for the mathematically demanding work of cryptography code. It lacks basic primitives that would be required for this sort of work, like large precise integers or a secure random number generator. TLS. So, how do we prevent man-in-the-middle attacks? With transport layer security. You take the chocolate that is HTTP and the peanut butter that is TLS, ram them together, and you get HTTPS, a complete explanation of which is beyond the scope of this article. The long and short of it, though, is that you get a secure HTTP connection that can't be spied on or tampered with over the wire, so long as everyone is using TLS properly. Ideally, any time a user of your site has to send you sensitive data, whether it be a password or something else that they would prefer to keep private, you should be protecting that connection with TLS. Okay, with that prelude out of the way, Let's get to actually securing our web service. First and foremost, HTTP basic auth, the simplest of schemes. Just send a name and password with every request. This, of course, absolutely requires TLS, because you're passing a Base64 reversibly encoded name and password with every single request. Anybody listening on the line could extract username and password trivially. Most of the basic auth is insecure arguments come from a place of basic auth over HTTP, which is an awful idea. This is the most restful solution. The server requires no knowledge of state whatsoever and authenticates every individual interaction with the user. Most REST enthusiasts insist that maintaining any sort of state is heresy and will froth at the mouth if you start talking about tokens. The browser provides baked-in HTTP basic auth support, but it is ugly as sin. If you wanted to get around the ugly browser-provided authentication window, you could always prompt the user for a name and password in JavaScript and stash it in browser memory, using it every time you make a request to the server. There's a problem with this, though. You are caching, on the client side, a username and password. If your browser runs any malicious code at all, ever, the first thing that malicious code will do is take that username and password and beam it off to a nasty third party which means that you are stuck with the browser's ugly basic auth. If you could tamper with the browser's authentication form, then so could an attacker, so you can't. Don't get me wrong, though, HTTPS and basic auth can be a pretty compelling choice. Let's imagine that we don't have access to TLS for a second. We can't use HTTP basic auth. It sends username and password almost in plain text over the wire. So what we do is hash the password and send that instead. Now an attacker can't grab the user's password, but they can still steal a value that they can use to authenticate themselves to the server. What if we hash the password and another variable that we change every single time? Well, that's better, but there are still ways to take advantage of this. For example, what if they take our security hash and message, stop them both from getting through, and then send their own command with our valid token? 
So now our protocol also has to include some method of signing the request. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. It's starting to feel like we're rolling our own crypto. Remember earlier when I said don't roll your own crypto? Yeah, there, there are pre-existing protocols for this, and we should use them instead. When it comes to getting some method of security without TLS in play, our options are HTTP Digest Authentication, which is built into most browsers, or OAuth 1.0, which is not. These protocols lay out a series of complicated steps to perform on the server and client side, and they're both passably good at keeping your users' details out of the hands of the bad guys. Like in HTTP Basic, the only way to do HTTP Digest authentication in the browser is to invoke the browser's ugly HTTP authentication window. As for OAuth 1.0, it's only a protocol for secure API access over HTTP. It's completely inaccessible from a browser. But I could write an OAuth 1.0 client in JavaScript. No, you can't. JavaScript crypto, remember. Bearer token. A bearer token is a token granted by the server, indicating that a user has successfully logged in. Generally, the token is a big block of random data. It doesn't carry any information in and of itself, it just maps on the server side to a user. I don't want to say that this is better than basic authentication. It's stateful, for one thing. True REST advocates will tighten their buttocks angrily at the mention of tokens. Bearer tokens, however, are less delicate than usernames and passwords. The worst case scenario with a bearer token is still bad, an attacker can pretend to be a user with your service, but at no point does the attacker get access to password data. It is important to generate tokens in a very random way. Should you use a bad random number generator to generate tokens, it may become possible for an attacker to guess what the tokens will be before they are generated. Then they can whip up a whole batch of potentially valid tokens with which to attack your service. Python's random function, for example, uses the system's time to seed the random number generator. An attacker could use network activity to guess a range of approximate times for sign-in, then use those times as seeds. With those seeds, they could ask Python's random number generator to manufacture a bunch of tokens. One of those tokens is likely to be the same token that you had just issued your user. They could just try each token in turn until one of them worked. Python's random function is a bad idea anyways. It uses a randomness generation algorithm called the Mersenne Twister, which is not cryptographically secure. A property of Mersenne Twister output is that an attacker with a sample of existing output can predict future outputs. Another common thing to consider with token implementations is token expiry. Given that you're likely to lose a token to a bad guy here or there, it's useful to kill old tokens and force the user to occasionally reapply for them. As you might imagine, even if you're using tokens, you still need TLS. Otherwise, there's literally nothing to stop attackers from taking your users' tokens and doing whatever they want with them. For a while, some popular web services didn't use TLS, and some clever developers released a browser extension called Firesheep that allowed you to sit in, for example, a coffee shop on a public internet connection and log into the Facebook account of anybody who is in the same coffee shop with you. Cookies. It is possible, and common, to put the authentication token in a cookie. This doesn't change any of the properties of auth with the token, it's more of a convenience thing. All of the previous arguments about tokens still apply. Also, make sure to include your cookie data in the list of things that you protect with TLS. Sessions. Session authentication is just token authentication, but with a few key differences that make it seem like a completely different implementation. Users will start with an unauthenticated token. The backend maintains a state object that's tied to a user's token. The token is provided in a cookie, and the application environment abstracts all of these details away from you. Aside from that, though, it's no different from token authentication, really. OpenID. OpenID is a suite of protocols allowing someone to log into your service without a username and password. Instead, an OpenID provider vouches for the person in question. OpenID does have its own problems. For one thing, the site that implements the OpenID protocol is the one responsible for redirecting you to the OpenID provider to enter your credentials. This means that it's trivially easy to instead send you to a phishing page and steal your OpenID credentials. Providing OpenIDs for users can be difficult and complicated, and several smaller OpenID providers have disappeared, leaving their users with accounts gone missing. Accepting OpenIDs from users can be difficult and complicated as well, because different OpenID providers can interpret the standards just slightly differently. Even with these problems, though, OpenID is growing as a standard. 
Google offers its services as an OpenID provider, and supporting OpenID can be a great way to leave the nasty business of password storage up to someone else entirely. OAuth 2.0 OAuth 2.0 is a security framework, providing a group of suggestions related to how you might go about granting access to some of your application's data to a third party, or getting access to some of a third party's data. If, for example, you find yourself wanting to access to some data from your user's Google account, maybe their contacts, you would have to go wading into the wonderful world of OAuth 2.0. The problem with OAuth 2.0 is that it's not really a protocol, it's a framework. So much of the specification was left unspecified that two valid implementations of OAuth 2.0 are likely to be completely unable to talk to one another. So big players like Facebook and Google just sort of implemented whatever parts of OAuth 2.0 they felt like. If you think you might be able to offer OAuth 2.0 functionality on your site, think very hard about it. While it's possible to build a secure system under the OAuth 2.0 flag, it's entirely possible to build a system that is both valid OAuth 2.0 and completely insecure. Thanks for watching. Now, go to my website and subscribe to my channel and give me all of your money. Yes, do these things. Do them now.